Today is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We're so thankful that Christ has finished the work on the cross, that he has conquered sin and death with his blood that was shed on the cross. Um, and we're so, so thankful for that this morning. So uh, this morning, actually, let's take a few moments and, and greet those around us.
Thanksgiving Sunday day. We're glad you are here. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. And that's what we're here to celebrate today and celebrate tonight as well. We encourage you to take out your program if you would. And on the right hand side, you see that little tear off section. If you're a regular attender, take a moment and uh, put your name on there. On the flip side, any prayer requests. If you're a guest here for the first time today, put your name and Address, telephone number, email, contact information, if you would. And uh, if you're a first-time guest, see Anita at the information booth. She'll give you a gift and appreciation for you being here. But all of us who fill these out, I encourage you to drop them in the boxes out in the lobby after uh, the service this morning. 
Well, I want to just encourage you, even if you haven't signed up yet, there's still room and uh, plenty of room downstairs. So join us at 5 p.m. tonight for our annual Thanksgiving feast. We're just going to have a great time of food. We're going to have a great time of fellowship. And we're going to share testimonies of what God has done in our lives and here at our church. And so you'll see the uh, sign-up sheets out there if you want to sign up and what to bring still. We encourage you to do that. Thank you for those who participate in Operation Christmas Child. We donated 61 boxes, and uh, that was all uh, sent over to Coram Deo Bible to be sent out. And so we appreciate all of you who participated in that. And it's part of our Give Christmas Away, and we'll have another opportunity soon as we ring bells at Hy-Vee, and we'll be talking about that in a few weeks here. I want to tell you about a ladies' event. You'll see a little table out there. And... Uh, it's coming up on December 3rd from 9.30 to 10.30 on that Saturday morning. Share Christmas joy. And uh, if you want more information, it's out there. Sign up by November 30th so they know how many people are coming. And suggested donation is $5 at the door. Today at 10.45, we have connect groups in Sunday school. But next week, because of the Thanksgiving weekend, um, we're just going to not have connect groups at all or Sunday school. We'll just have normal worship at 9.15 on the 27th. And as a reminder, too, there's no men's group, no WANA or CAS student ministry this week due to the Thanksgiving holiday. And I encourage you, <clears throat> excuse me, look in your program and out in the lobby, we have these Christmas invitations. It's for our Christmas sermon series, all of our Christmas services from November 27th up to December 25th. On the flip side of it, it tells you all the upcoming things besides that. And uh, so this is a good way for you to invite people uh, to come. I find that the Christmas season is one of the best times of year to invite people. People are more open, it seems like, to coming and, and be involved in some traditional Christmas things. And so please take these out. Invite your neighbor. Invite your coworker. Invite your uh, students at school that you sit with in class. And just encourage them to come and join us. Last week, we kicked off the remodel project, a capital campaign. And some of you, uh, as you came in, you probably got some envelopes. We're passing out pledge forms from now until the end of this month. And then we're encouraging you to pray over that period from the 27th or as you get that pledge form even now. Uh, how much you would give toward that $102,000 that we need. As I said, the elders have designated 10000 of the 212000 for it, so the cost that we need is $102,000. Uh, so I encourage you to prayerfully consider that, fill out that form, tear off that one piece that you keep for yourself as a reminder, and then drop those into boxes or bring them to the church office or however you want to do that. Uh, we ask that these pledge forms will be returned by December 31st, and then we'll have a meeting on January 8th to see where we're at and what God is leading us to do at that point. Well, uh, last week we had Dale Von Toon share a testimony, and now we have one of our newer members coming. And so I'm going to invite Sam Church to come, and he's going to share a testimony about God's goodness. So come on in. Come on up. Well, hello. I'm Sam Church. I'm a member here. Um, Pastor Ed uh, asked me to speak today. I uh, prepared for you a four-part lecture here, about 55 minutes in length. <laughs> but on the way here, uh, my wife, Melissa, informed me that it's actually supposed to be one to three minutes. So I've just cut it down to just the good parts for you today. Hopefully it's going to be, it'll be all right. So, being thankful, what is that thankfulness? What does it mean to be thankful? One of the things I think of being thankful is my first known ancestor here in what would be America, which I found out was a man named George Soule. And he came here in the year of our Lord, 1620. 
He came to this untamed land as an indentured servant. He came here with nothing but the clothes on his back. I can scarcely imagine what it must have been like getting off that ship after that long two month journey and looking at that tree line, not having any idea what kind of beasts or wonders were on the other side of it. It was a new world and he had no real possessions or money to his name, but there is something he did have, thankfulness and the good sense to be grateful for the fact that he made it here alive without dying or of disease or hunger. And he had good sense to be thankful for the greatest gift that any of us can ever receive, the opportunity of forgiveness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the chance of everlasting life in heaven. George was eventually freed from his indentured servitude and went on to receive a laker of and land and married a woman named Mary, and they had many children. George was likely at the first Thanksgiving feast here in America. George and I had somewhat different views on our Christian faith, but regardless, he had the good sense to be thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and to pass it along to his children. I wasn't always an attendee of church growing up. My parents, uh, although I am, I was always in a church family because that's my last name. It's church. <laughs> I found out most of what I knew about the Bible from secular sources like television. One of those stories was the book of Job. I was aware of what Job went through to test his faith in the Lord and I understood it. When my dad died when I was 14, that day I reflected on Job and tried to relate to his story. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And I was still thankful for what I had. I was an unbaptized sinner for many years after that, although still loosely Christian. By the time I met Melissa, my wife, I had a strong desire to become a stronger Christian. And eventually, over several years, I have become a stronger Christian, in great part due to Pastor Ed and the great people of this church who took us in and helped us to become stronger believers in Christ. We are very thankful for that. I am personally very grateful that God has blessed me with such a wonderful life even though for many years I didn't deserve it. I am very thankful that I had people along the way to subtly nudge me in the right direction when I was weak or lost in my faith. I'm thankful that I met a wonderful woman that would become my wife that helped me to get where I am. I'm thankful that God blessed me with a wonderful child and God willing with more, maybe someday, I am thankful for my job, for my house, my family and friends, and many other people and things in life. Some are dead and some are living, but I'm so very thankful for them all. I encourage you to not only silently reflect on your blessings this Thanksgiving as we continue an important tradition, feasting with our friends and family, but to also take turns sharing out loud with those family and friends what you are thankful for, what God has blessed you with. Maybe make it part of your tradition. My Uncle Chuck, I called him my Uncle Buck. When he was dying back in 2017, the long effects of Agent Orange on his body from his time as a combat medic in Vietnam was sitting with his very best friend, Pastor Chuck Stevens. He said to his friend, I'm a winner, you know. And Pastor Stevens said to him, a winner? Chuck, what do you mean? And he says, because if I live, I get to be here with my family and friends. And if I die, I get to go be with the Lord. 
If we believe in Christ, his sacrifice, and what he did, and we make genuine efforts to turn away from sin, then we are the ultimate winners. Because when we die, we get to go be with the Lord. And for that, I'm very thankful. Thanks. Just before our offering, I'm going to invite Stellaire Roth to come. She's going to come. She's part of our missions team, and uh, um, I'm going to let her share what they would like to have you know for this Christmas season. Come on, Stellaire. Hi, I'm Stellaire, and today I'm talking to you on behalf of the missions team. Um, and we're going to talk about Christmas gifts for our missionaries. And I just want to briefly tell you what the missions team is, just in case people might not be familiar with it. Um, but it's just a group of some members in our church, and we help keep in our we help our church keep in contact with our missionaries. We kind of divide it up, and each person is responsible for reaching out and seeing what their needs are, our prayer requests are, and. Um, we also help oversee the missions funds and making sure we're being good stewards of that and that our funds are going to fruitful ministries. So um, this time every year we give a missions gift um, or a Christmas gift to our missionaries and we usually like to do $200 per family and we have about 15 families we support right now. Um, this year we don't quite have the funds to do all that. We have about half of our goal. Um, but that's why we wanted to bring it up to you guys today, um, just in case anyone feels called to give to the missionaries in that sense. Um, if it is something you do want to do or are interested in, um, you can give just like you give your regular offerings. We have the box out in the hallway. And um, if you do that, you want to make a little note, like Christmas gift for the missionaries, just so we don't get it mixed up in our regular funds. And if you do cash, we have envelopes you can use for that. If you give online, there's a drop-down menu for uh, Missionary Christmas Gift, and you can select that. So we make sure it goes to the right people. Um, deadline is December 1st, just to make sure we get it out to the families by Christmas. And um, we kind of discussed a little bit. If we don't reach our goal, we discussed possibly just taking the lump sum and dividing it evenly among the families rather than skipping people. But we're just going to see what we collect and go from there. So if you want to give a few dollars or if you feel called to do more, maybe do the $200 gift for a family. Um, either way, we're going to make sure it gets to the right people and that um, we take good care of it. So um, if you have questions, you can talk to Pastor Ed or myself, or I can point you to other missions team members. Or if you'd like to be a part of the missions team, if that sounds interesting, let us know because we'd love that too. So the goal is $3,000, but they have $1,500 toward that already. So if we could raise another $1,500, that would be fantastic. And she shared everything you need to know. So let's go to the Lord in prayer for our offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your bountiful blessings. Lord, as I drive around town and I see most of the harvest is in, it's just mindful of the fact for our farmers how you've blessed them once again with the proper amount of sun and minerals in the soil and rain and all those things to provide the food that feeds the world. And we just uh, thank you, Lord, for your abounding blessings upon us, Lord. And we just ask that you would just um, guide and direct us as we think of our giving week by week. And we think of the Remodel Project Capital Campaign that we pray that you'll give us wisdom and direction on. We think of uh, giving to this Christmas offering for our missionaries. Lord, thank you that as we give, it's, it blesses them and ministers to them and extends their ministry. So Lord, we just uh, thank you for the opportunity to give and it is a part of our worship to give back to you a portion of what you bless us with. And we long for you to use it to further your kingdom. We pray and ask these things now in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue in our worship this morning through um, our responsive reading. And uh, if you turn uh, to the back side of your, your program this morning, you'll find question 46. What is the Lord's Supper? Now, this week we are not, uh, we're not 
partaking in the Lord's Supper. Um, maybe we should have planned that out to synchronize with it, but that's okay. Um, so uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, let's, uh, let's read that answer together of what is the Lord's Supper. Christ commanded all Christians to eat bread and to drink from the cup in thankful remembrance of him and his death. The Lord's Supper is a celebration of the presence of God in our midst, bringing us into communion with God and with one another, feeding and nourishing our souls. It also anticipates the day when we will eat and drink with Christ in his Father's kingdom. And let's read that passage from 1 Corinthians uh, 11 um, this morning, verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He took the cup and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, please stand uh, as we continue to give thanks uh, for God's faithfulness this morning. We won't move without you. We won't. 
may be seated. It's time for our kids to make their way downstairs. I encourage you to take out your Bible. Turn over to Psalm 84. Psalm 84, if you would. I enjoy looking at the Psalms. There's always some special nuggets of truth hidden there, in there if you dig deep and study it. And uh, as we go through this passage verse by verse, I hope that you're encouraged as we talk about satisfying a hunger for God, and I believe that's what this psalm is all about. Psalm 84, I'm going to read the entire psalm and encourage you to follow along. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faint for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise, Selah. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer, give ear. O God of Jacob, Selah, behold our shield, O God, look on the face of your anointed, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this psalm of praise. We thank you for the attitude, the heart of the psalmist. And we pray that you'll help us to incorporate that into our lives if we don't already have it, Lord. To come hungry, prepared, and excited to worship you today. Lord, we just pray that your word will have its intended purpose as it goes forth. May it encourage, may it convict, may it do its work in each of our hearts and lives. And we commit this time into your hands, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have you ever been so hungry one time or another? Uh, well, maybe you were so hungry that you just couldn't uh, wait to get something to eat. And when you finally got the opportunity to eat something, it tasted better than you could have ever imagined that it would. Uh, it seems like that when we don't eat for a while, all of a sudden our taste buds become alive. And when we get to eat that certain food, it tastes different than when we eat it during the normal times of our life. And I think for you and for me, as we think of this week of Thanksgiving, that we're going to be offered and hopefully experience some of the best food of the year. And here's a sampling of some of the favorite side dishes served at Thanksgiving around the country. This is according to eatthis.com. They did a study of, or a poll in these uh, states. And Alabama was number one. It said their number one side dish was dressing. Dressing. Uh, Alaska was hash brown casserole. And Delaware was mac and cheese. There you go, John, mac and cheese. John Kendall. Yep, thank you. From our cookbook, right? There you go. And then Florida, sweet potato casserole. Hawaii is turkey gravy. And what do you think Iowa would be? Corn, that's right, corn. Illinois is mashed potatoes and Oklahoma is rolls, to name 
just As you read, touching your mind and your heart and your soul. Getting down in there to what really meets your need. Is studying God's word or reading it for your devotional time filling up your hunger and your soul and satisfying you that Jesus is all that you need? The first four verses of Psalm 84 talks about our hunger for God and the joy and satisfaction he can give us, especially in our time of deepest need. Some background, you see a little subscript at the top of the psalm. This is a psalm of the sons of Korah. Who were these guys? Well, these were Levites who were faithful to the Lord. It was some of their relatives who challenged Moses' authority and had the ground open up and swallow them. These were some of their relatives, and they were still alive. And the sons of Korah were the singers in the temple, according to 1 Chronicles chapter, or 1 Chronicles chapter 6. You'll notice that these particular genres in the psalm, it's a psalm that includes a hymn. It includes a prayer. It includes a lament and a song of Zion. Zion, speaking of Jerusalem. It appears that this psalm was being sung as a procession of people were making a pilgrimage leading to the temple in Jerusalem for some kind of celebration of a feast. So let's look at three attitudes that we need to have when it comes to worship. This will remind us how to put the fire back into our personal worship and when we gather as a church family in public praise of God. First thing on your outline is come hungry to worship. Come hungry to worship. It says in Psalm 84, verses 1 through 4, I'll read those again to reemphasize these. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faint for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise, Selah. Hungering and being satisfied with God. As we sit here today, are you truly satisfied with God? Are you growing more in love with the Savior the longer you serve him and the longer you go through life experiencing him? Can you say with Job what he learned near the end of his suffering? In Job 42, 5, he said, I heard of you, speaking of God, by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Job is talking about his before and after time of suffering. You remember in Job chapter 1, in one day, he lost just about everything except his wife. And even his wife said, curse God and die after losing family, livestock, slaves being taken away, buildings destroyed. But you know what? Through that whole experience of suffering that he went through toward the end, and, and it says there in Job 42, he knew of God because we know in the beginning he was even sacrificing for the atonement and the covering of sin for his kids. But now, after going through this period of suffering, He'd experienced God, and he is now saying, I heard of you, but now I see you. And when you've gone through your period of spiritual darkness, the tough times in your soul, do you have a closer relationship with God, and does it make you want to hunger for him more? The psalmist had an appetite for God, and it's clearly seen in the first several verses of Psalm 84. The psalmist's love for the dwelling place is the key thought. He said, how lovely is your dwelling place? This is symbolic of God's presence, ever present in our lives, but especially as they gather together to worship in the temple. The courts, the assembled people gather together to lift up their praises to God. He says in verse two, my soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord, my heart and flesh sing for the joy to the living God. All of us as believers should share that same yearning, that same desire for the awareness of God's presence in our lives. The psalmist goes on in verse 3 and talks about the sparrows and the swallows. Now, in the Hebrew, these are just common birds, and they are building their nests right there in the temple. And it overwhelms the psalmist with praise to think about 
Here, even the common birds with the temple servants and the priests and the people, they are part of the overwhelming ability to worship and see God and see his presence. He goes on to express this awe in verse 4 in a form of a blessing. Everyone has hungers within them, a hunger for companionship, a hunger for community, for involvement in something greater than themselves. Others hunger for perspective or purpose in life. <clears throat> Others hunger for knowledge and understanding of the world around them. Still, some possess a gnawing hunger of emptiness, restlessness, or that hard to explain gut feeling that something is missing in their lives. The next thing we see is hungering and thirsting after the things that do not satisfy. <clears throat> that do not satisfy. One reason your, public, your worship or our worship as we gather together can at times be cold and lifeless is because we have ruined our appetites. We've satisfied our hungers with the junk foods of this world. We've attempted to satisfy our hungers on excesses of food and drink, entertainment, work, maybe obsessive study, sex, drugs, or worldly companions, or focus on worldly organizations. Consequently, it's no wonder our worship is half-hearted at times. We have been gorging ourselves on the junk food of the world, and we don't come hungry for God, and we don't worship him with fire and zeal. That's why I put in your notes, and I've shared this quote numerous times, but I encourage you to take it home and meditate on it because there's real depth to think about this. C.S. Lewis in The Weight of Glory said, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are too, far too easily pleased. We are far too easily pleased. We have to dig. We have to study. We have to spend time with God to build and experience him more and more in his fullness in our life. To balance that thought out, God does want us to enjoy his creation, the wealth that we have and the capacity to do fun things. And I remind you that the poorest person in America is richer than two-thirds of many people in our world. We do have a lot of wealth. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, Paul said, As far as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, proud, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but set them on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. For the Christian, God's world is our playground as long as we look at it from the perspective of it giving glory to him. The key is that we are glorifying God and not being purely pleasure seekers without a sense of his presence and his priorities in our life. God wants us to have vacations and to travel with or without our families. God wants us to do nice things as we can afford them and maintain them along with keeping Christ at the center of our life. It becomes a problem or an idol when money or travel or entertainment or materialism or you fill in the blank, becomes the drive and the purpose to justify what we do to attain these opportunities. We have to guard against making these things idols and sacrificing time with God and his people, worshiping to fulfill our fun and our pleasure. That is the balancing act that all of us as believers have in our current world. And when God's people of old were consumed with idols and wicked things, they would do something simple and dramatic, they would return to God by fasting and prayer. In Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, here's a good example. Joel the prophet said, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. That's important. Because see, a sign of repentance and mourning was to tear your garments. He's saying, rend your hearts. Surrender your hearts, repent, turn from your sin. Abraham Lincoln issued these thoughts in a proclamation of Thanksgiving observance during the Civil War in October of 1863. He made this declaration, he says, I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands 
to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I, re- and I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions or praises justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble repentance for our national perverseness and disobedience commend to his tender care all those who become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife, the civil war, in which we are unavoidably engaged, and fervently implore the interposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. That was Abraham Lincoln, October of 1863. Fasting, repentance was a sign that the Israelites were serious about turning back to God. I challenge you to get serious about building fervency and zeal into your public worship by fasting, minimizing all the things of this life that can so easily distract us. Seek simplicity. Cut out those things that are stealing your hunger for God. And if you do that, you'll be well on your way to putting enthusiasm back into your personal worship as well as the public worship when we gather together as God's people. Here's the application under this first point. Do you find an enriching sense of joy as you grow in your experience with God? Do you find an enriching sense of joy as you grow in your experience of God? It's so important. This is more than building up knowledge by memorizing his word. It's experiencing and being in relationship with God. Another attitude we need to fan and see it grow in us, for each of us, is to come prepared to worship. Come prepared to worship. Come hungry, come prepared. Verse 5 of Psalm 84 says this, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As these pilgrims go through the valley of Baca on their way, they're making their pilgrimage to Jerusalem, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. We're to come to worship with prepared hearts. Our hearts prepared. The reason for God's blessings lies in God's desire to protect, to provide, to care for those who are wise and walking upright lives. It says in verse 11 of this chapter, blameless lives, lives that come where we've confessed our sin, we've turned away from our pride and our selfishness, and we ask for forgiveness. We're not going to be perfect, but he says those who are living uprightly, blameless lives. Blessings are given to those who are walking in God's will and abiding, dwelling in God's presence wherever they live. In verse 5 of Psalm 84, we see God blesses those who put their trust in him. Now, what does he mean here in verses 5 and 6? He's giving us some imagery here. And what does he mean? Well, highways to Zion. The highway or the road as they traveled was symbolic of God's assistance and support in their times of need as they were making their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. This could be describing people who are coming from all over Israel to Jerusalem to go up for some annual feast. They're singing psalms as they go. Notice verse 4, it says they are ever, better translated forever, singing praises to God. They may be going for the Feast of Weeks, Shabbat, the first fruits, or known as Pentecost as well, or Passover, or the Feast of Tabernacles, which is that one week celebration that they, you know, build canopies out of branches and live out in the open to remind them of the wilderness wandering of the Israelites. Focus with me on the words in whose hearts are the highways to Zion, meaning the worshipers had prepared their hearts to go to public worship in Jerusalem. The NIV says whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. <clears throat> they were ready for the journey as they left and they sang all the way, preparing their hearts for when they would gather with God's people in the temple. 
Moreover, their hearts and attitudes transformed the wilderness into joy. The Valley of Baca was a place of desert, and there wasn't any water. The picture here is that as they sang and brought joy to others, it was like bringing pools or springs to the Valley, valley of Baca. And when we praise God in our worship services, it brings joy to us, and it flows out of us to bring joy to others. That's the imagery here. He says to come to provide that joy to other people. And I I ran across this quote attributed to Timothy Keller recently that I think will help us understand the idea of coming prepared for worship and bringing joy to others around us. He said, quote, public worship is only the manifestation of a private worship. The reason our public services are dead is that our private devotional life is dead. The quick fix of injecting more upbeat music into our services may seem to solve the problem, but we have ignored the disease that will destroy us unless we seek God's cure. Our church congregations fail to sing with conviction because the song isn't in their hearts before they come to the service. End of quote. Did you catch that? Our public worship is only a manifestation of our private worship. I believe that's true. So how do we prepare ourselves for public worship on Sunday? We do that by privately worshiping on Monday through Saturday. And then he said in there is the song in our hearts before we come to Sunday worship. Are we preparing ourselves Saturday night, Sunday morning as we get up? Are we focusing in on this opportunity to gather together in praise and thanksgiving and uplifting of the Lord by what we've done all week long, as we'll talk about the rhythms of our life. Building our personal faith in God daily will help us gain the favor and grace of God and give us strength to strength. As it says in verse 7, I love that phrase, strength to strength, because it's a picture, and I liken it to the Israelites in the wilderness. When daily, they would to wake up, and they would go out and get the manna, which was the food of heaven a coriander seed, according to what many people believe. And they would gather this food, and they would have enough food for that one day. And if they gathered more and tried to save it to the next day, when they woke up, what they saved had rotted. When they got to Friday, they had to gather enough food for two days because there wouldn't be any food to gather on Saturday, the Sabbath. What was God teaching them? He was teaching them to daily depend upon him for strength, for food, to focus on him. And I think we are the same way. We gain that strength daily by not worrying about tomorrow, for tomorrow is not promised to us. Second, by reading God's word and communing with God, fellowshipping with him in prayer. This is where we get our spiritual refreshment, our energy to serve and joy in our lives. So we need to gather on Sundays to recharge our spiritual batteries. And we do that by preparing throughout the week, staying in the word, praying, and then coming together. We understand this principle especially well when we think of athletes. What do they do? They practice, they run drills, they condition, they look at film, they strategize for whatever game is coming up to try to beat their opponent. See, they have to do all that preparation for the big day, for the game. The same is true with us. It's awful hard to stir up love and good works in others Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, when we haven't prepared our hearts beforehand. So I encourage you, take time Monday through Saturday this upcoming week to sing songs about the Lord, to put them into your heart, to read God's word, to put what he says into your heart. Pray to God, honor Jesus, stand in awe of him and his work and his fellowship with the saints. Doing these things when we are not together will prepare our hearts for when the church comes together for public worship and consequently will help put the joy back into our public worship. So our application is this. How much value and importance do you put on gathering on Sundays to worship with God's people? I encourage you to come here about 9, 10. Some come in here and bow their head and get their hearts ready. Others fellowship. But gathering in here right at 9, 15, and uh, encouraging the worship team as they lead us to begin the service, as we begin the live stream. 
I encourage you to do that. But how much value and importance do you put on gathering on Sundays to worship with God's people? One last point as we finish this beautiful psalm. Come excited to worship. Come hungry, come prepared, come excited to worship. Look at verse 9. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. Excited to be with God and his people. Verses 8 and 9 go together. In verse 8, the psalmist is appealing to the king of all kings, Yahweh, the God of Jacob, the glorious king. Remember, God changed the name Jacob to Israel, and God was the shepherd over Israel and his 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. We see in verse 9 that the psalmist asked God to protect the current king of Israel. And as he was protected and blessed, so God's people would be protected and blessed by the king's reign and authority and protection of his people. We see in verse 10 of Psalm 84 how the psalmist is overwhelmed with being able to be in God's presence. He says, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Worship with God is better than being anywhere else. Being a temple guard in the service of the priest is better than public recognition or wealth, he's saying. We worship God when we acknowledge his working in our workplace around us. We worship God when we do our best as a mom or dad or grandfather, grandmother, to be all that God wants us to be, to bless the people that are in our care. We worship God when we stop and see the beautiful sunset that he creates. And lately in this fall season, we've seen some really beautiful sunrises and sunsets. And when we see recently the lunar eclipse here in the Quad Cities and the pictures coming from the James Webb Space Telescope, and there's a picture of the Cartwheel Galaxy. This galaxy formed as a result of a high-speed collision that occurred a long time ago. The Cartwheel is composed of two rings, a bright inner ring and a colorful outer ring. Both rings expand outward from the center of the collision like shock waves. However, despite the impact, much of the character of the large spiral galaxy that existed before the collision remains, including its rotating arms, is still there. This leads to the spokes that inspired the name of the Cartwheel Galaxy, which are the bright red streaks seen between the inner and outer rings. Now get this. It is 489.2 light years away from our planet. Light zips through interstellar space at 186,000 miles. One light year is 5.88 trillion miles per year. Multiply that times 489. That's an astronomical number about how far away this thing is. The beauty of God's creation. And throughout Psalm 84, the psalmist has expressed the excitement about going to the public worship at the temple. We see that in verse 10. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. A companion, a companion verse is in Psalm 122.1. This psalmist said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Can you agree with the psalmist and say that about coming to our worship services weekly? Notice that his excitement was not built around the great singing or hearing inspirational preaching or, for that matter, any external act of worship. Rather, his excitement was built around being with God and his people worshiping together. If you're looking to be excited every week by the songs that will be sung or preaching that you will hear, you may be dissatisfied at times. Me, the pastor, or whoever speaks from time to time could be off or the message maybe not as inspirational as you would have hoped. The songs may be a little flat or a selection too old or to suit your taste. However, if your excitement and joy about worshiping with your brothers and sisters in Christ is built on God and who he is, you will never be dissatisfied. So excitement is the outgrowth of the rhythms of our life. Excitement is the outgrowth of the rhythms of our life. In verse 11, he said, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. I love that. No good thing. 
And here's the condition to those who walk uprightly. God wants to bless us more than we could ever imagine. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to see some of the blessings that we left on the table. Because either we didn't ask or by the way we lived, we couldn't, we couldn't have those things for whatever reason. God desires to bless us. And God's favor or grace is like the sun, he says. God draws near to his own and showers them with his blessings and glory like a bright light. The shield obviously shows the grace of his protection over us. He wants to shower his goodness on those who walk upright lives and bring honor and blessing upon them. Psalm 23, verse 6. We're familiar with this psalm. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I love Exodus 33, 19. God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Well, verse 12 closes out this psalm. This is a bookend to the first verse. He opens and he closes the same way. They both look up to the great king, the Lord Almighty, In verse 12, he says, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Now to build on the two previous points, the psalmist was excited because he was coming to God hungry and prepared. His excitement was an outgrowth of his lifestyle. He didn't feed on the junk food of the world, nor was he lax in the preparation of his heart, all of which led him to be excited to worship. Do you want to experience more joy and share that joy more in worship? If so, then the challenge for you is to do the following. Come hungry by declaring a worldly junk food fast in your life in order to cultivate a real hunger for God. Come prepared by engaging in private worship throughout the week. Build spiritual disciplines into your life. Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster in any book that Dallas... Dallas Willard wrote, are good places to start. Talking about living in simplicity, in solitude, in fasting, in lengthy times of intercessory prayer, meditating on scripture, taking a Sabbath, a day, to focus on God. These are some examples of things that you can incorporate into your life to help you come better prepared to worship. And then come excited by building your anticipation on God rather than the externals of worship. Come saying, God, whatever is going to occur in this service today, I have an open heart, an open mind, and I want to exalt and point people to you through my praises. I want to give of myself to you, but I know, God, you will give me something to take away as well. So here's the application. Do you wake up on Sunday mornings anticipating being in God's presence with God's people. It's just that simple. Do you wake up Sunday mornings thinking, boy, I can't wait to be here so I can be with God and worship him, but also with his people here in this room. Friend, I believe if you do these things, you'll see your spirit rejuvenated. Your public and private worship something you will not want to miss. This experience with God through the rhythms of your life will grow in you and transform your thinking about what is really, really important in life. Here's our key thought as we close. Christ followers should have the attitude of coming to worship, to give back to God. That should be the main reason we come, to give back to God, but to be open for God to speak to us, to give to us, to make us a little bit more like him as a result of gathering together. And as we close, here's a little bit of humor as we think about our dinner tonight. From Irma Bombeck, Thanksgiving dinners take 18 hours to prepare. They're consumed in 12 minutes. Half times take 12 minutes. This is not a coincidence. There's a plan, right? So question to ponder. Are you hungry to meet with and hear from God currently? Think about that. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, for the psalm. I read the psalm so many times. It's always been an encouragement to me. Thank you this week I got the chance to dig down deep into it and to learn the background and the context of it and how applicable it is to my life. And I hopefully it's for 
all of us in this room and those on the live stream. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord, to cultivate a hunger in our lives for you, to not settle for the things around us that give us short-term happiness, but help us to go for the full joy by digging into a study of you and practicing spiritual disciplines and being able to turn away from the things of this world and turn our eyes on you. Lord, help us to not only be hungry, but also help us come prepared for worship each Sunday. And help us to be excited to gather together with God's people as we worship together. Build that into our lives as we move into this Christmas season as well. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand once again this morning. And I, uh, it's kind of funny, I noticed in the quote that Pastor Ed read uh, by uh, Tim Keller that talked about upbeat songs. Um, but we are going to close with an upbeat song. Um, but I do, I, I do encourage you to, to ponder uh, the words, um, as, as Pastor Ed discussed, um, that, that our hearts be prepared um, that our, our worship is not just um, through singing, obviously, as we, we discuss each and every week. Um, our whole lives need to reflect that we are worshiping God with every single thing that we do. Um, so let's sing uh, this last song here this morning.
I, as I think of that song, when we interviewed Austin three and a half years ago, that was the song you, you played for us. So I was thinking about that. Yep. Well, as we uh, close, I encourage two things. One, join us for Connect Groups at uh, 1045 here in just a few minutes, Kids Sunday School. And please, please, if you're still on the fence about coming tonight, sign up and come. You'll be blessed. We'll be singing three songs. It'll be all about the food and testimonies as we gather together uh, as a church family. For our last slide up on the screen, do we have it? Can you find it? There you go. So just a reminder of what we're here and what we do each time we gather together, whether that's on Sunday or throughout the week. We connect with God and others. We grow in our relationship with one another and God, grow deeper in that relationship, and then we serve God in our church and our community around the world. And let's remind ourselves of the Great Commission today. Let's say it together. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for gathering us together to lift up and exalt the King of all kings, wonderful counselor, Prince of Peace, mighty God, everlasting Father, the Rose of Sharon, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and on and on it goes, hundreds of names. And we're just scratching the surface to praise you when we, when we honor you here through music and through prayer and your word. We look forward to that day when we gathered around with millions upon millions of people around your throne to see you face to face and worship you because you're so worthy of our praise. Guide and direct us as we go out and be mindful of a heart, having a heart of gratitude as we go. We pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.